Welcome to Napa Valley Inside Out. I'm Latif Hasen, and I am delighted to be hosting this podcast, shining a light on one of the most beautiful and coveted lifestyles in the world. If you're interested in developing a property, planting a vegetable garden, making olive oil, fashion, architecture, interior design, county rules and regulations, biking paths, art, getting into the wine business, farming practices, the tax benefits of owning a vineyard, or the ultimate private tours and tastings, and all the fabulous annual cultural events we enjoy here, and so much more, then you won't want to miss this show. Every week I will be interviewing amazing talent, vintners, entrepreneurs, leaders, consultants, event planners, and more. They will share their knowledge, experience, advice, goals, passions, and their best kept secrets. Hello everybody, we are back with Andy Beckstoffer. This is part two of our interview and we're going to be focusing on Beckstoffer Vineyards. So Andy, tell us about vineyard designation and why it's important. Well, back in the 1980s and almost into the 2000s, Napa Valley wines, the best wines were blends and they were called reserves. BB Private Reserve, a Madavi Reserve, and what they were, they were blends the winemaker put together. And all the winemakers were basically blending to the same consumer taste. So the wine writers began to say, it's all vanilla and chocolate. And so we said, how do we raise it to the next level? How do we raise the quality of Napa Valley wines to the next level? And that's about emphasizing the terroir, vineyard designation. I've always said that reserve wine is like a Ken or Barbie doll. They're perfect. Yeah. If they, they bring them in and they, if they need a little shoulder, they need some breast, they need some chin, whatever, you do that and they're all perfect. But a vineyard designate is like a fit beauty with a chipped tooth and her charm is in the way she carries her defects. And these vineyard designates are not perfect. So that was what we were trying to do, and you better have the best terroir. But I can remember back in 1988 or 89, we had vineyards and we wanted to do vineyard designate, and we had this press release, and we were starting to do things, and people said, the winers, you can't, it's too one-dimensional. You can't have all of those characteristics and all that personality is just so in one terroir. So one of the things that Andre Chelichev said, in those days everybody wanted to do the, the Bordeaux blend, the, the five Bordeaux varieties, uh, Cabernet, Cab Franc, Merlot, Cab Franc, and Petit Verdot. And Andre said, don't do that. Diversify, but divers diversify with clones of Cabernet. Oh. So we began to diversify with clones of Cabernet, giving the winemakers what we call the spice rack. You know, so they could go in and they could pick 20% of, one guy might pick 20% of this and 40% of that and 40% of number three. Other guy would pick 60% of the first one and then less than that. So they could put personality and complexity into those wines. And what happened is, because of the terroir of these vineyards, they, we raised the price, I mean, raised the quality of Napa Valley, I'm talking Cabernet primarily, and if you'll check today and you look at the list of the 50 top wines of Cabernet, you'll find, I bet you 35 to 40 of them are vineyard designates, yeah. showing the particular terroir of a certain property, and the wines are better than they have been, than they were in those days, and they're all unique. How many acres do you own in Napa Valley? Over a thousand vine acres. Vine acres. Yeah. And how many in Mendocino and Lake Counties? More in Mendocino and more in Lake. We own 1,500 in Lake and 12, 1,300 in Mendocino. I remember you telling me years ago when we were at dinner one time that I have to take you up to Lake County. It's so fabulous. Yes. And then I, when I was talking to your assistant this week, she said, oh, he's going to love talking about Lake County. So yeah. tell us why you're so enthusiastic about Lake well, County. Well, the thing was when we... When, when Veloxra hit here, mm -hmm. and we did all the replant, we plant, replanted 95% of the Napa Valley, and by 1995, we were done, and we thought we would go to Mendocino County and replant that when Veloxra came there. It didn't, but we wanted to expand, and we wanted to expand in Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, 
And also, our guys want to be home at night. We never wanted to be in the car or an airplane and travel to the Central Coast or anything like that. So when, when we go from here to Mendocino County, we could take a left and go to Sonoma County. We would take a right and go to Lake County. Well, if you go to Sonoma County, there's really very little Cabernet there, and the land is almost as expensive as Napa. But Lake County had a terrible re reputation. And because they had planted Cabernet in the wrong place, and they planted other things in the wrong place, and they were really oriented to quantity and not quality without very many environmental concerns. So we went over and we started digging soil pits and looking at the land. And we found one area, the Red Hills area, that we thought we could grow great Cabernet. And so in, in Lake County, we farm at 200 feet above sea level here. We start at 2,000 feet above sea level and they're rolling hills. And we, never, we have never planted in the hillsides here because you get, with the alluvial fans, you get soil streaks and you can't get uniformity in the, in the grapes and in the harvest. But there, all the soil is blown on by the eruption of Mount Kanakta. It is totally uniform, full of obsidian cobbles, and we can't get to the bottom of it. So, mm, go ahead. And so then we did our research. We looked at diurnals in terms of the cold and the hot and the, those things, and we found it was all in the same basic region as we are here. For Cabernet, so you're planting. Cabernet. So of your thousand acres there, oh no, how much, you have more? 1,500, yeah. 15, so of that, how much is Cabernet? 1,499. Oh. <laughs> 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 and tell me about the quality. Tell me about the soils. I had Paul Anamosa on recently. Yeah. Um, that was really interesting. Tell me about the soils in, um, in Lake County yeah. and how they compared to the soils, um, Cabernet soils here, the good Cabernet they, soils. They're all uh, volcanic soils. Mm -hmm. and they're all uh, well-drained soils. In other words, Cabernet does not like wet feet. Right. It has to drain, and they're all class four soils. In other words, you grow vegetables in class A soils, you grow, you, you grow Cabernet, or grape, all of that grapes are basically in, in class D soils. So they are well-drained, they are, they are volcanic soils, and they the, so that's basically the temperature story. Well, the, I mean, is that the soil story? It's it's a loamy, sandy, loamy soil, mm -hmm. uh, and but the, then then the climate is much like it is in Napa. We don't have as many heat spikes in Lake County as we do in Napa, and the season is shorter in Lake County. It's more like Bordeaux than Napa mm. is. Napa starts it starts earlier and ends starts early and ends later because we don't have the fog in Lake County. When we have a hot day, we have a hot day. We get more degree days, that thing. So I think we now know what the grape quality is in Lake County, and I think it's good. But most people in Lake County have been buying that Cabernet and putting it in a $20, $30, $40 dollar bottle of wine. So we have started a program to get some of the prime winemakers from Napa County and other places who have made a $200 bottle of Cabernet to make wine from the Red Hills of Lake County. And we gave them free grapes for three years. They have to decide after this harvest whether they want to go forward with it. We're very, very enthusiastic about it. Another thing about Lake County, in Napa County you can pretty much grow grapes everywhere. Some quality, good, bad, and different. The, the, the bottom is not the... In Lake County, you have to be very careful about the areas you go to because it can be too hot and the soils can be too heavy. But the Red Hills area seems to be the one that's standing out. You are a brilliant businessman. Get them in there, give them free grapes, and they're going to make wonderful wine. So at the moment, you're selling it for a lot less money. Yes, yes. And then it could increase the value if you get some good winemakers, yeah. Sure. We, for example, the, the thing that you asked about vineyard designation, and we... We took the vineyard designation and then we coupled onto it what's called bottle price formula pricing. Oh yes, I was getting to that. I love that. What happens is that in the in past days, everybody there is a district average of all the prices in the district. And for example, for Cabernet, it might go from four hundred dollars a ton to fifty thousand dollars a ton. Absolutely. And then you get an average and people would, would say, do I get 10% above the average or 10% right. below the average? But that's a commodity pricing. Mm -hmm. Commodity pricing, you have a big crop, you have a low price, you have a small crop, you have a big price. Nothing to do with quality. Nothing to do with what the end product is like. We said, we don't, we don't want to do that. 
we think we have this great terroir that they're named after our vineyards so that to buy our grapes, you're going to have to put our name on the bottle, Beckstar for Tokelon Vineyard. And we want a percentage of the retail price. We don't want anything to do with that commodity because if I got a, a bottle, of, if I'm putting grapes into a $150 bottle of wine, it has nothing to do with those grapes that sold for $400 a ton. Absolutely nothing. And I don't want, I don't want, don't want to be involved with that. So we said that that's the way we'll price our grapes, percentage of the retail price. And what happened is that we began to change the conversation in Napa. In the past, when a we have a very detailed formula of how this is done, but we changed the focus of the negotiation in that in the past, people said, well, give me 10% more, 10% less than the commodity price. Now the farmer begins to say, what's the price of the bottle that my, my grapes are going into? And in his mind, he says, I should get 100 times that. So we change that focus and we change the economics, if you would, of growing grapes in Napa County, which has several effects. One is that the economics of growing grapes now pays. You can make money growing grapes and pays. But secondly, where in agriculture it's generally the case that the grower or the producer wants to overproduce and the processor winery wants to underpay. So you get this conflict that you always hear about in agriculture. Well, we don't have that anymore. We'll do everything we can to get him a better bottle of wine. We want him to sell it for adequate price and then we participate. So we're on the same page, and I think that makes better wine, and I think it's proven that it's making better wine. And lastly, because now the name of the vineyard goes on the bottle, and it makes a difference, we have a much better chance of preserving the agriculture here. Now the consumer wants those vineyards to stand, and it's economically viable for the farmer to keep them in, and we make better wine because of the way we price. I think this came in uh, some years ago, correct me if I'm wrong, I, re I remember um, the winemakers started wanting a longer hang time. Yes. Therefore, a lighter weight yes. in the yields, right? Lighter yes. weight, therefore, you're the grower, you get less money, yes? And I think then you stood up, there was a big forum conference about it, and you yeah. said, I okay, I've got a solution to this, this is what I'm doing. So you were the only person to start that 100 times the bottle price, right? Yes. And then it started um, in 1977, so it's an oh, overnight it? success. Oh, oh. <laughs> I just remember since I was here. Yeah. Um, but I remember within the last 10 years, it, it just came to the fore again. I think. Yeah. Um, so I think that more people are doing it now. But you've had a revision to the hundred times the bottle price. Yes. Yes. Tell us about that. What happened was that the formula. We went back and we looked historically to see what percentage of the of the winery's revenue has been allocated to grapes. And we went back to the 70s and did this, and we actually did it in the 70s, and we found out it was 26% rate roughly across the board. So we, what we needed to do was somehow translate the retail bottle price of a bottle of wine to a ton of grapes. And most wineries, when they look at their revenues, they look at it per case or per gallon. We said, but no, we gotta look at it per ton. So what we did is we got the, the um, the price that the winery got for their wine, and, and it started out being all FOB, which is 50% of retail, times the 26%, times the amount of cases per ton they got. And if you work that through, you'll find that the price of a ton of grapes is a roughly 150, 100 times the price of the bottle of wine. Right. But then things changed. One, the revenue, per the revenue changed for the winery, and the amount of tonnage, the amount of cases they got changed. When you went direct to consumer, the winery gets 100% of the retail price and not 50% that they got when they went through a wholesaler. So we changed that. We did a survey of our people, of the winery, and we found that for these kind of wines, these vineyard high price vineyard designated wines, they were getting between 60 and 100% was going direct to consumer for which they would receive 100% of the retail price. So we accepted a number of 80, halfway between. And we found that their cases per ton were no longer 67 to 80, they were between 50 and 60. So we accepted a 55 cases per ton. 
So now the equation still using the 26% with that comes up 150 times the retail bottle price because of the change in the way it's marketed and the change of the way it's produced. But the, the formula kept itself, formula kept itself. And this is what happens when MBAs are growers. <laughs> Quite brilliant, yeah. Well, yeah. I don't know, but, but the other thing about that, in, and this works for vineyard designated wines, when just think about Beckstar for Togolon Vineyard, is a brand. And it's probably, yeah. it's probably a better brand with more consumer franchise than this startup or young winery. So our brand is better than their brand. Yeah. And we're licensing to use our brand. And so we're not only selling them an agricultural commodity grapes, we're selling them a branded product. And we should be paid for that as well. Yeah, I mean, you're a branding guy too. Yeah, I, I totally agree. So what percentage, so you do this multiple of the bottle price only for your premium vineyards? Yes, but yes, yes. And, and the other ones, we still ask the question, where are these grapes going? What's the bottle price that's going? It may be going into a Napa Valley product. But you have to be careful with that because in those, in, in those situations, you might not make up 100% of the, wine, of the grapes making that wine. So you may be making the percentage that makes it all better. So you don't have restrictions on, do you, do, when you sell your grapes, do you say that you can't be, you have to be a certain percentage, uh, well, to have your name on it, do they have to be 100% uh, your grapes or? Have to be vineyard designated. Vi vineyard designated, okay. Yes, yes. Okay. Um, so how do you choose who you sell your grapes to? Good question. Yeah, given that you're such a and strong and fabulous brand, you, it would, it well, would be a concern. Well, the first thing is, Remember, winemakers make wine. Yeah. Got to have good vineyards, but winemakers make wine. And the other thing is that if you want to talk about what a great vineyard is, a great vineyard makes great wine. You can talk all day about the soils and everything else, but if it doesn't make great wine, it's not a great vineyard. That's, that's period. It, period. Yeah. So the first thing we look for is who's the winemaker? Who is the guy who's going to trans transform those grapes into wine? And secondly, does he have an owner who understands quality, understands the marketing needs, and has, has the ability and the, the, the attitude to market these wines properly at the proper price? Because now, remember, we're getting a percentage of that. So you don't want somebody right. with $150 grapes wine selling it for 40 bucks. Exactly. And so you need, you need both tiers of it. So that's how we look at it. Winemaker first, owner second. So you must have some pretty tight contracts then. Pay contracts, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. About what price point they can sell their wines for. And well, we set a minimum. And then we know, the people we talk to, we know they will charge what the market will bear. And so we leave that up to them. Again, if we've gone through this process mm -hmm. and, you know, if you, you have a, $80 bottle of wine and it's getting 100 from the wine spectator in Parker, well, we expect that not to be $80 for very long. <laughs> I know, isn't that the truth? You know, yeah, it's, yeah. it's all in the ratings, yeah. So um, tell us about some of your vineyard designates, some of your wonderful vineyards. Well, we have, we have 12 vineyards in Napa County. And it's interesting that we bought seven of those from wineries, including Tokolon, including Las Piedras, and, and, and including Vineyard George III. Rem remember when we would go back to that story about vanilla and chocolate and reserves, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the winemakers thought, people thought, the wineries thought, that the, crit the, critical, in the critical ingredient was the winemaker's skill. Right. And we said, no, it's the vineyard. Uh. So seven of those 12 we bought from wineries because they didn't value the contribution of the vineyard. So you only have premium vineyards in Napa Valley? I think so. Oh, wow. <laughs> See, I didn't realize that. I thought you might have had some that weren't premium vineyards. No, we, we have Cabernet in the St. Helena, yeah. Rutherford and Oakville Appalachian, and, Oak, and, and then we have Merlot in the Oak Knoll Appalachian, and then we have Pinot Noir and Chardonnay and Merlot in Canaris. So they're all in the traditional uh, grape grown regions. And, and six of them are what we call heritage vineyards, and that means they were initially planted in the 19th century. The thing about 
truly premium vineyards is that the total is more than the sum of the parts. Now you can look at the longitude and latitude, you can look at the soils and the climates, but it's, it's the way that's put together and the timing of it so that, that you don't know whether it can produce great wine or not until you've done it over a period of time. Mm -hmm. So when these vineyards have been producing the finest that's been produced around here in all of that period. So what we sought out very early is to buy these heritage vineyards. Um, and you're mostly on the, you're on the valley floor. All the valley floor. Again, my problem with the hillside is these, uh, yeah, these, these fans. Yeah. And I, what we need to do is we need to get uniformity in the vineyard and in the grapes. When we pick grapes, we want them to be, let's just say, 27 balling, but we want the least to be 26.5 and the more to be, uh, to be 27. Five. We don't want a 24 and a 28 to get an average. And so we need that uniformity and it's tough to get it with the soil streaks. We like the hillsides and that's the charm of the Red Hills of Lake County. We can be at elevation. It looks like Tuscany. Yeah. It, yeah. Those rolling hills yeah. at elevation, mm -hmm. but we don't have any of that lack of uniformity problem. But so all of, our, all of our vineyards are in the prime areas and on the valley floor in Napa County. And um, do you do any dry farming? Yes and no. We, we dry farm when the, soil, when the vines don't need it. We, we have irrigation everywhere we can, but it's, it's about moisture management. And at mm -hmm. some point, moisture management says keep it dry. And at other times it says give it some water. But you give water for the vine, not for the fruit. I mean, it used to be the thing you give water to pump up the fruit. We don't do that. But if the vine waters life, I mean, we go back to measure C. Mm -hmm. Waters life. And so that when it needs it, we give it to it. And we try to give it what we call deficit irrigation. We mm -hmm. give it a little bit less than it needs. Mm -hmm. So it struggles a bit, but it doesn't die. Right. Think right. about it. Think about it if you have a sandy, sandy soil. You can't dry farm. Mm -hmm. You simply cannot. Most, many, there are some sandy soils around here, but there's, many of them are loamy, sandy loamy. So you can dry farm, but you need to look at the individual plot and say, how much moisture do these vines need? And give it that. And if it doesn't need any, don't give don't it give any. It to, yeah. Yeah. Do you remember how much you paid for your first vineyard? Cabernet vineyard? Yeah, yes I do. Hmm. It's crazy. Um, that's probably $3,000 an acre. An acre. But, but I remember when we bought in Canaris, we bought land in Canaris for much less than we get per acre, much less than we get per ton today. But remember now, I've been here for 50 years, so <laughs> yeah. that's it's lots of things have changed. And, and in those days, it cost us less than 2,000 acres to farm it. Now it costs 9,000 acres to farm it, yeah. you know. So. so what do you think about vineyard valuations? Where are we hitting? Do you think we'll hit a million dollars an acre for Cabernet? Well, I think we're there. Yeah, where? Oh, I mean, I'm not selling Toco on, but who, who, nobody would sell Toco for less than a million dollars an acre. W would you sell some at a million dollars an acre? I might no. have a buyer for you. No, no, my, all, I mean, this is the fact, is all of my vineyards, are the, all the prime vineyards are now in what they call National Treasures Trusts. And it's important for people who, I'm not giving tax advice, but in the United States, they have a law against perpetuities and other trusts can't allow can't stand more than 99 years. But several states, Del Delaware being one, has a law that overcomes the law against perpetuities. And until the federal government sues the state of Delaware, that will remain there. So we have trusts in the state of Delaware that will last forever. And those trusts say that you may not develop these vineyards and you may not sell them. And so since they're trusts, they never go to probate. So these vineyards will forever be in my family this land will forever be in my family, and if there's something hits here that you can no, no longer grow anything on them, there'll be parks. And I'm sure I've said this often, that, that um, some spouse of a great-great-grandchild of mine is going to hate me. Yeah. It's a totally un-American. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry. I started with nothing, and if you have to start with nothing, I tried to make it better, but yeah. <laughs> if that didn't yeah. work, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 So would you pay a million dollars an acre for a vineyard that you coveted? Yeah, um, yeah. you got to be, i got to 
covered it a whole lot, but I'd pay, I'd pay a lot, probably much or more than anybody else would, less than that. But I, I certainly, if somebody wanted to sell me some more Tokolon, I think it'd be worth it. Now, who are the other owners of Tokolon? Robert Madavi Winery, mm -hmm. the McDonald family. Oh, I didn't the, know that. The Graham McDonald family. Trevor Trainer owns a little bitty piece. Mm -hmm. And I think now that, well, when I say Constellation, Robert Madavi Constellation owns the biggest piece. And, um, and um, University of California Davis owns a little piece. And I think Opus has a little piece. But remember, there's a conflict about what Tokolon is. Yes, what it, well, how big is Tokolon? Well, tell us about that. Well, the thing is, Hamilton Crabb, who did Tokolon, Developed, rich, developed. developed it and named it and everything. It was 240 original acres, and then he bought another 115 acres next to it. So there's 357 acres that Hamilton Crab owned and planted grapes on. We say that's Tokolon. Now, the Robert Madavi Company came and got a trademark Tokolon back in the 1980s, and they say that, and they can put anything in Tokolon they want, they say it's 550 acres. So... That's the debate, and we're, we're comfortable with everybody saying what they say, but that's what I say is that, that Tokolon is the land that Hamilton Crab owned, and there's 357 acres of it, and planted, it's 357 acres of it. Do you think that in that huge acreage, the soils are similar, very the same? There are lots of differences. Yeah. There's there are a lot of yeah. differences in that. We have, we have, we have Vineyard George III, which is the old BV number three. It's mm -hmm. almost 300 acres. And we think there's about 40 acres of that that's cult Cabernet. Mm -hmm. The rest of it's very good Cabernet, but not that prime cut. So in 357 acres, you've got to assume there's a certain amount prime cut and the rest of it. Well, Mandavi grows Sauvignon Blanc on some of it for their eye block. So, Amazing. I mean, well, what makes Tokolon vines so phenomenal? I mean, the, 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 the grapes coming off there. What is it that's so special about Tokolon? I don't know. That's a good answer. It, like I said, the total is more than some of the parts. So mm -hmm. I can tell you about the soils. I can tell you about the rainfall. I can tell you about the climate. I can tell you longitude and latitude. But it's like farming. In farming, anybody can tell you what to do, all the steps to do. But timing is extremely important. When you do this, when you don't do that, how long do you do that? And so at a place like Tokolon, all of that comes together that makes the total more than the sum of the parts. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. All I know is empirically it produces wine that winemakers and consumers say that's totally unique and very nice. What about the Crane Vineyard and some of the other ones? What is well, the same thing? This, Dr. This Crane, Dr. Jo the if you read the history, the founders of the great business in the Napa Valley were Dr. George Belden Crane in the vineyards and Charles Krug in the winery. So George Belden Crane started, it had 200 acres, of which ours is a part, in 1858. Hamilton Crabb didn't come to Tokolon until 1868. And so that's part of the vineyard that has been in vineyards, except in the, I guess in the 1930s, it was Chinatown. But otherwise, it has been in grapes forever. And when we bought it, it was in, what was it in? Uh, red grapes, not undistinguished red grapes, but fantastic red grapes. It hadn't been in Cabernet, it had been in everything else. So we turned it into Cabernet, but it had been producing great red grapes for as long as anybody knew. So we, again, named it Dr. Crane to bring up that history. And then, it, it's just, we're just here for this passage. It has been great forever, mm -hmm. and we're here for a certain period of time, and applying all the modern techni techniques and the attitude of not only producing great grapes, but branding the vineyard. I was going to say, you're fantastic at branding. It's so important, yeah. And so people need to know that. I mean, what we know about food, premium food, the more premium the food, the more it's sold based on where it's grown, whether it's Vidalia onions or Atlantic salmon or Napa Valley Cabernet. So we need to tell them what that's about. And we need also to tell them that it's been in vineyards for this long because, again, great vineyards produce great wines and not just one year. So empirically, we can say the total's more than some of the part. It's proven itself over a long period of time. But we need to communicate that to the consumer. 
How uh, uh, frequently or how long do your Cabernet grapes on the valley floor typically last before you have to replant? We plan on 20 years. And generally, it runs that. We have grapes in Mendocino County, Chardonnay and grapes in Mendocino County. We planted in 1975, and they're still producing. So, Amazing. but something seems to happen. You're not going to change the variety so much, but you may want to change the row direction, or you may get some bug hit it. But we plan on 20 years, but we, sometimes we go a lot less, sometimes we go a bit more, not a whole lot more. So we've managed to get through two 30-minute shows, and, we, right. and, I, and I haven't finished, so I'm going to invite you back. <laughs> thank you so much well, for being you. here. It was really right fantastic. Right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I look forward to seeing you next week.